Nick McGee and Ethics, Book 8. Section 1. After what we have said, a discussion of friendliness would naturally follow, since it is a virtue or implies virtue, and is besides most necessary with a view to living. For without friends, no one would choose to live, though he had all other goods. Even rich men and those in possession of office and of dominating power are thought to need friends most of all. For what is the use of such prosperity without the opportunity of beneficence, which is exercised chiefly and in its most laudable form towards friends? Or how can prosperity be guarded and preserved without friends? The greater it is, the more exposed it is to risk. And in poverty and in other misfortunes, men think friends are the only refuge. It helps the young, too, to keep from error. It aids older people by ministering to their needs and supplementing the activities that are failing from weakness. Those in the prime of life, it stimulates to noble actions, two going together. For with friends, men are more able both to think and to act. Again, parents seem by nature to feel it for offspring and offspring for parent, not only among men, but among birds and among most animal. It is felt mutually by members of the same race, and especially by men, whence we praise lovers of their fellow men. We may even in our travels see how near and dear every man is to every other. Friendship seems, too, to hold states together, and lawgivers to care more for it than for justice. For unanimity seems to be something like friendship, and this they aim at most of all, and expel faction as their worst enemy. And when men are friends, they have no need of justice, while when they are just, they need friendship as well, and the truest form of justice is thought to be a friendly quality. But it is not only necessary, but also noble. For we praise those who love their friends. And it is thought to be a fine thing to have many friends. And again, we think it is the same people that are good men and are friends. Not a few things about friendship are matters of debate. Some define it as a kind of likeness and say that like people are friends. Whence come the sayings, like to like, birds of a feather flock together, and so on. Others, on the contrary, say, two of a trade never agree. On this very question, they inquire for deeper and more physical causes. Euripides saying that parched earth loves the rain, and stately heaven, when filled with rain, loves to fall to earth. And Heraclitus that it is what opposes that helps, and from different tones come the fairest tune and all things are produced through strife. While Empedocles, as well as others, expresses the opposite view that like aims at like. The physical problems we may leave alone, for they do not belong to the present inquiry. Let us examine those which are human and involve character and feeling. For example, whether friendship can arise between any two people, or people cannot be friends if they are wicked and whether there is one species of friendship or more than one. Those who think there is only one because it admits of degrees have relied on an inadequate indication, for even things different in species admit of degree. We have discussed this matter previously. Section 2. The kinds of friendship may perhaps be cleared up if we first come to know the object of love. For not everything seems to be loved, but only the lovable. And this is good, pleasant, or useful. But it would seem to be that by which some good or pleasure is produced that is useful, so that it is the good and the useful that are lovable as ends. Do men love, then, the good, or what is good for them? These sometimes clash. So, too, with regard to the pleasant. Now, it is thought that each loves what is good for himself and that the good is without qualification lovable. And what is good for each man is lovable for him. But each man loves not what is good for him, but what seems good. This, however, will make no difference. We shall just have to say that this is that which seems lovable. Now there are three grounds on which people love. 
of the love of lifeless objects, we do not use the word friendship. For it is not mutual love, nor is there a wishing of good one to the other. For it would surely be ridiculous to wish wine well. If one wishes anything for it, it is that which it may keep, so that one may have it oneself. But to a friend we say we ought to wish what is good for his sake. But to those who thus wish good, we ascribe only good will, if the wish is not reciprocated. Good will when it is reciprocal by friendship. Or must we add when it is recognized? For many people have good will to those whom they have not seen, but judge to be good or useful. And one of these might return this feeling. These people seem to bear good will to each other. But how could one call them friends when they do not know their mutual feelings? To be friends, then, they must be mutually recognized as bearing good will and wishing well to each other for one of the aforesaid reasons. Section 3. Now, these reasons differ from each other in kind. So, therefore, do the corresponding forms of love and friendship. There are, therefore, three kinds of friendship, equal in number to the things that are lovable. For with respect to each, there is a mutual and recognized love. And those who love each other wish well to each other in that respect in which they love one another. Now, those who love each other for their utility do not love each other for themselves, but in virtue of some good which they get from each other. So, too, with those who love for the sake of pleasure. It is not for their character that men love ready-witted people, but because they find them pleasant. Therefore, those who love for the sake of utility love for the sake of what is good for themselves. And those who love for the sake of pleasure do so for the sake of what is pleasant to themselves. And not in so far as the other is the person loved, but in so far as he is useful or pleasant. And thus these friendships are only incidental. For it is not as being the man he is that the loved person is loved, but as providing some good or pleasure. Such friendships, then, are easily dissolved if the parties do not remain like themselves. For if the one party is no longer pleasant or useful, the other ceases to love him. Now, the useful is not permanent, but is always changing. Thus, when the motive of the friendship is done away, the friendship is dissolved, inasmuch as it existed only for the ends in question. This kind of friendship seems to exist chiefly between old people, for at that age people pursue not the pleasant, but the useful, and of those who are in their prime or young, between those who pursue utility. And such people do not live much with each other either, for sometimes they do not even find each other pleasant. Therefore they do not need such companionship unless they are useful to each other. For they are pleasant to each other only in so far as they rouse in each other hopes of something good to come. Among such friendships, people also class the friendship of a host and a guest. On the other hand, the friendship of young people seems to aim at pleasure for they live under the guidance of emotion, and pursue above all what is pleasant to themselves and what is immediately before them. But with increasing age, their pleasures become different. This is why they quickly become friends and quickly cease to be so. Their friendship changes with the object that is found pleasant, and such pleasure alters quickly. Young people are amorous, too, for the greater part of the friendship of love depends on emotion and aims at pleasure. This is why they fall in love and quickly fall out of love, changing often within a single day. But these people do wish to spend their days and lives together, for it is thus that they attain the purpose of their friendship. Perfect friendship is the friendship of men who are good and alike in virtue. For these wish well alike to each other qua good, and they are good themselves. Now those who wish well to their friends for their sake are most truly friends. For they do this by reason of own nature, and not incidentally. Therefore their friendship lasts as long as they are good, and goodness is an enduring thing. And each is good without qualification and to his friend. For the good are both good without qualification and useful to each other. So too they are pleasant, 
for the good are pleasant both without qualification and to each other, since to each his own activities and others like them are pleasurable, and the actions of the good are the same or like. And such a friendship is as might be expected permanent, since there meet in it all the qualities that friends should have. For all friendship is for the sake of good or of pleasure, good or pleasure either in the abstract or such as will be enjoyed by him who has the friendly feeling, and is based on a certain resemblance. And to a friendship of good men all the qualities we have named belong in virtue of the nature of the friends themselves. For in the case of this kind of friendship, the other qualities also are alike in both friends. And that which is good without qualification is also without qualification pleasant. And these are the most lovable qualities. Love and friendship, therefore, are found most and in their best form between such men. But it is natural that such friendships should be infrequent, for such men are rare. Further, such friendship requires time and familiarity. As the proverb says, Men cannot know each other till they have eaten salt together, nor can they admit each other to friendship or be friends till each has been found lovable and been trusted by each. Those who quickly show the marks of friendship to each other wish to be friends, but are not friends unless they are both are lovable and know the fact. For a wish for friendship may arise quickly, but friendship does not. Section 4. This kind of friendship, then, is perfect both in respect of duration and in all other respects, and in it each gets from each in all respects the same as or something like what he gives, which is what ought to happen between friends. Friendship for the sake of pleasure bears a resemblance to this kind, for good people too are pleasant to each other. So too does friendship for the sake of utility for the good are also useful to each other. Among men of these inferior sorts, too, friendships are most permanent when the friends get the same thing from each other, for example, pleasure, and not only that, but also from the same source, as happens between ready-witted people, not as happens between lover and beloved. For these do not take pleasure in the same things, but the one in seeing the beloved and the other in receiving attentions from his lover. And when the bloom of youth is passing, the friendship sometimes passes too, for the one finds no pleasure in the sight of the other, and the other gets no attentions from the first. But many lovers, on the other hand, are constant. If familiarity has led them to love each other's characters, these being alike, but those who exchange not pleasure but utility in their amour are both less truly friends and less constant. Those who are friends for the sake of utility part when the advantage is at an end, for they were lovers not of each other but of profit. For the sake of pleasure or utility, then, even bad men may be friends of each other, or good men of bad or one who is neither good nor bad may be a friend to any sort of person. But for their own sake, clearly only good men can be friends. For bad men do not delight in each other unless some advantage come of the relation. The friendship of the good too and this alone is proof against slander. For it is not easy to trust any one talk about a man who has long been tested by oneself. And it is among good men that trust in the feeling that he would never wrong me, and all the other things that are demanded in true friendship are found. In the other kinds of friendship, however, there is nothing to prevent these evils arising. For men apply the name of friends even to those whose motive is utility, in which sense states are said to be friendly, for the alliances of states seem to aim at advantage and to those who love each other for the sake of pleasure, in which sense children are called friend. Therefore, we too ought perhaps to call such people friends, and say that there are several kinds of friendship. Firstly, and in the proper sense, that of good men qua good, and by analogy the other kinds. For it is in virtue of something good and something akin to what is found in true friendship that they are friends. 
since even the pleasant is good for the lovers of pleasure. But these two kinds of friendship are not often united, nor do the same people become friends for the sake of utility and of pleasure. For things that are only incidentally connected are not often coupled together. Friendship being divided into these kinds, bad men will be friends for the sake of pleasure or of utility, being in this respect like each other, but good men will be friends for their own sake, in other words, in virtue of their goodness. These then are friends without qualification. The others are friends incidentally and through a resemblance to these. Section 5. As in regard to the virtues, some men are called good in respect of a state of character, others in respect of an activity, so too in the case of friendship. For those who live together delight in each other and confer benefits on each other. But those who are asleep are locally separated, are not performing, but are disposed to perform the activities of friendship. Distance does not break off the friendship absolutely, but only the activity of it. But if the absence is lasting, it seems actually to make men forget their friendship, hence the saying, out of sight, out of mind. Neither old people nor sour people seem to make friends easily, for there is little that is pleasant in them, and no one can spend his days with one whose company is painful or not pleasant, since nature seems above all to avoid the painful and to aim at the pleasant. Those, however, who approve of each other but do not live together seem to be well disposed rather than actual friends. For there is nothing so characteristic of friends as living together, since while it's people who are in need that desire benefits, even those who are supremely happy desire to spend their days together, for solitude suits such people least of all. But people cannot live together if they are not pleasant and do not enjoy the same things, as friends who are companions seem to do. The truest friendship, then, is that of the good, as we have frequently said, for that which is without qualification good or pleasant seems to be lovable and desirable, and for each person that which is pleasant or good to him. And the good man is lovable and desirable to the good man for both of these reasons. Now it looks as if love were a feeling, friendship a state of character, for love may be felt just as much towards lifeless things but mutual love involves choice, and choice springs from a state of character. And men wish well to those whom they love for their sake, not as a result of feeling, but as a result of a state of character. And in loving a friend, men love what is good for themselves. For the good man in becoming a friend becomes a good to his friend. Each, then, both loves what is good for himself, and makes an equal return in goodwill and in pleasantness. For friendship is said to be equality, and both of these are found most in the friendship of the good. Section 6. Between sour and elderly people, friendship arises less readily, inasmuch as they are less good-tempered and enjoy companionship less. For these are thought to be the greatest marks of friendship productive of it. This is why, while men become friends quickly, old men do not. It is because men do not become friends with those in whom they do not delight. And similarly, sour people do not quickly make friends either. But such men may bear goodwill to each other, for they wish one another well and aid one another in need. But they are hardly friends because they do not spend their days together nor delight in each other, and these are thought the greatest marks of friendship. One cannot be a friend to many people in the sense of having friendship of the perfect type with them, just as one cannot be in love with many people at once, for love is a sort of excess of feeling, and it is the nature of such only to be felt towards one person. And it is not easy for many people at the same time to please the same person very greatly, or perhaps even to be good in his eyes. One must, too, acquire some experience of the other person and become familiar with him, and that is very hard. But with a view to utility or pleasure, it is possible that many should please one. For many people are useful or pleasant, 
and these services take little time. Of these two kinds, that which is for the sake of pleasure is the more like friendship, when both parties get the same things from each other and delight in each other or in things, as in the friendships of the young. For generosity is more found in such friendships. Friendship based on utility is for the commercially minded. People who are supremely happy, too, have no need of useful friends, but do need pleasant friends. For they wish to live with someone, and though they can endure for a short time what is painful, no one could put up with it continuously, nor even with the good itself if it were painful to him. This is why they look out for friends who are pleasant. Perhaps they should look out for friends who, being pleasant, are also good, and good for them, too. For so they will have all the characteristics that friends should have. People in positions of authority seem to have friends who fall into distinct classes. Some people are useful to them and others are pleasant, but the same people are rarely both. For they seek neither those whose pleasantness is accompanied by virtue, nor those whose utility is with a view to noble objects. But in their desire for pleasure, they seek for ready-witted people. And their other friends they choose as being clever at doing what they are told. And these characteristics are rarely combined. Now we have said that the good man is at the same time pleasant and useful. But as such a man does not become the friend of one who surpasses him in station, unless he is surpassed also in virtue. If this is not so, he does not establish equality by being proportionally exceeded in both respects. But people who surpass him in both respects are not so easy to find. However that may be, the aforesaid friendships involve equality. For the friends get the same things from one another, and wish the same things for one another, or exchange one thing for another, for example, pleasure for utility. We have said, however, that they are both less truly friendships and less permanent. But it is from their likeness and their unlikeness to the same thing that they are thought both to be and not to be friendships. It is by their likeness to the friendship of virtue that they seem to be friendships. For one of them involves pleasure and the other utility, and these characteristics belong to the friendship of virtue as well. While it is because the friendship of virtue is proof against slander and permanent, while these quickly change, besides differing from the former in many other respects, that they appear not to be friendships. In other words, it is because of their unlikeness to the friendship of virtue. Section 7. But there is another kind of friendship, vis-a-vis -vis that which involves in equality between the parties. For example, that of father to son, and in general of elder to younger. That of man to wife, and in general that of ruler to subject. And these friendships differ also from each other. For it is not the same that exists between parents and children, and between rulers and subjects. Nor is that even of father to son the same as that of son to father. Nor that of husband to wife the same as that of wife to husband. For the virtue and the function of each of these is different, and so are the reasons for which they love. The love and the friendship are therefore different also. Each party, then, neither gets the same from the other, nor ought to seek it. But when children render to parents what they ought to render to those who brought them into the world, and parents render what they should to their children, the friendship of such persons will be abiding and excellent. In all friendships implying inequality, the love also should be proportional. In other words, the better should be more loved than he loves. And so should the more useful, and similarly in each of the other cases. For when the love is in proportion to the merit of the parties, then in a sense arises equality, which is certainly held to be characteristic of friendship. But equality does not seem to take the same form in acts of justice and in friendship. For in acts of justice, what is equal in the primary sense is that which is in proportion to merit. While quantitative equality is secondary, 
But in friendship, quantitative equality is primary, and proportion to merit secondary. This becomes clear if there is a great interval in respect of virtue, or vice, or wealth, or anything else between the parties. For then they are no longer friends, and do not even expect to be so. And this is most manifest in the case of the gods, for they surpass us most decisively in all good things. But it is clear also in the case of kings, for with them, too, men who are much their inferiors do not expect to be friends, nor do men of no account expect to be friends with the best or wisest men. In such cases, it is not possible to define exactly up to what point friends can remain friends. For much can be taken away and friendship remain, but when one party is removed to a great distance, as God is, the possibility of friendship ceases. This is in fact the origin of the question whether friends really wish for their friends the greatest goods, for example that of being gods, since in that case their friends will no longer be friends to them, and therefore will not be good things for them, for friends are good things. The answer is that if we were right in saying that friends wish good for friends for their own sake, his friend must remain the sort of being he is, whatever that may be. Therefore, it is for him oily, so long as he remains a man, that he will wish the greatest goods. But perhaps not all the greatest goods, for it is for himself most of all that each man wishes what is good. Section 8. Most people seem, owing to ambition, to wish to be loved rather than to love. Which is why most men love flattery, for the flatterer is a friend in an inferior position, or pretends to be such and to love more than he is loved. And being loved seems to be akin to being honored, and this is what most people aim at. But it seems to be not for its own sake that people choose honor, but incidentally. For most people enjoy being honored by those in positions of authority because of their hopes for they think that if they want anything, they will get it from them, and therefore they delight in honor as a token of favor to come. While those who desire honor from good men, and men who know, are aiming at confirming their own opinion of themselves. They delight in honor, therefore, because they believe in their own goodness on the strength of the judgment of those who speak about them. In being loved, on the other hand, people delight for its own sake. Whence it would seem to be better than being honored, and friendship to be desirable in itself. But it seems to lie in loving rather than in being loved, as is indicated by the delight mothers take in loving. For some mothers hand over their children to be brought up, and so long as they know their fate, they love them and do not seek to be loved in return, if they cannot have both but seem to be satisfied if they see them prospering. And they themselves love their children, even if these, owing to their ignorance, give them nothing of a mother's due. Now, since friendship depends more on loving, and it is those who love their friends that are praised, loving seems to be the characteristic virtue of friends, so that it is only those in whom this is found in due measure that are lasting friends and only their friendship that endures. It is in this way more than any other that even unequals can be friends. They can be equalized. Now equality and likeness are friendship, and especially the likeness of those who are like in virtue. For being steadfast in themselves, they hold fast to each other, and neither ask nor give base services, but one may say even present them. For it is characteristic of good men neither to go wrong themselves nor to let their friends do so. But wicked men have no steadfastness, for they do not remain even like to themselves, but become friends for a short time because they delight in each other's wickedness. Friends who are useful or pleasant last longer. In other words, as long as they provide each other with enjoyments or advantages. 
Friendship, for utility's sake, seems to be that which most easily exists between contraries, for example, between poor and rich, between ignorant and learned, and for what a man actually lacks he aims at, and one gives something else in return. But under this head, too, might one bring lover and beloved, beautiful and ugly. This is why lovers sometimes seem ridiculous, when they demand to be loved as they love. If they are equally lovable, their claim can perhaps be justified, but when they have nothing lovable about them, it is ridiculous. Perhaps, however, contrary does not even aim at contrary by its own nature, but only incidentally, the desire being for what is intermediate. For that is what is good. For example, it is good for the dry not to become wet, but to come to the intermediate state. And similarly with the hot and in all other cases. These subjects we may dismiss, for they are indeed somewhat foreign to our inquiry. Section 9. Friendship and justice seem, as we have said at the outset of our discussion, to be concerned with the same objects and exhibited between the same persons. For in every community there is thought to be some form of justice, and friendship too. At least men address as friends their fellow voyagers and fellow soldiers, and so too those associated with them in any other kind of community. And the extent of their association is the extent of their friendship, as it is the extent to which justice exists between them. And the proverb, what friends have is common property, expresses the truth, for friendship depends on community. Now brothers and comrades have all things in common, but the others to whom we have referred have definite things in common, some more things, others fewer. For of friendships too, some are more and others less truly friendships. And the claims of justice differ too. The duties of parents to children and those of brothers to each other are not the same, nor those of comrades and those of fellow citizens and so too with the other kinds of friendship. There is a difference, therefore, also between the acts that are unjust towards each of these classes of associates, and the injustice increases by being exhibited towards those who are friends in fuller sense. For example, it is a more terrible thing to defraud a comrade than a fellow citizen, more terrible not to help a brother than a stranger, and more terrible to wound a father than anyone else. And the demands of justice also seem to increase with the intensity of the friendship, which implies that friendship and justice exist between the same persons and have an equal extension. Now all forms of community are like parts of the political community, for men journey together with a view to some particular advantage and to provide something that they need for the purposes of life. And it is for the sake of advantage that the political community, too, seems to have come together originally and to endure, for this is what legislators aim at, and they call just that which is to the common advantage. Now the other communities aim at advantage bit by bit, for example, sailors at what is advantageous on a voyage, with a view to making money or something of the kind fellow soldiers and what is advantageous in war, whether it is wealth or victory or the taking of a city that they seek, and members of tribes and deems act similarly. Some communities seem to arise for the sake of pleasure, vis-a-vis -vis religious guilds and social clubs, for these exist respectively for the sake of offering sacrifice and of companionship. But all these seem to fall under the political community for it aims not at present advantage, but at what is advantageous for life as a whole, offering sacrifices and arranging gatherings for the purpose, and assigning honors to the gods, and providing pleasant relaxations for themselves. For the ancient sacrifices and gatherings seem to take place after the harvest as a sort of first fruits, because it was at these seasons that people had most leisure. All the communities, then, seem to be parts of the political community and the particular kinds of friendship will correspond to the particular kinds of community. 
Section 10. There are three kinds of constitution, and an equal number of deviation forms. Perversions, as it were, of them. The constitutions are monarchy, aristocracy, and thirdly, that which is based on a property qualification, which it seems appropriate to call democratic, though most people are wont to call it polity. The best of these is monarchy, the worst democracy. The deviation from monarchy is tyranny, for both are forms of one-man rule, but there is the greatest difference between them. The tyrant looks to his own advantage, the king to that of his subjects. For a man is not a king unless he is sufficient to himself and excels his subjects in all good things, and such a man needs nothing further. Therefore, he will not look to his own interests, but to those of his subjects. For a king who is not like that would be a mere titular king. Now, tyranny is the very contrary of this. The tyrant pursues his own good. And it is clearer in the case of tyranny that it is the worst deviation form. But it is the contrary of the best that is worst. Monarchy passes over into tyranny. For tyranny is the evil form of one man rule, and the bad king becomes a tyrant. Aristocracy passes over into oligarchy by the badness of the rulers, who distribute, contrary to equity, what belongs to the city. All or most of the good things to themselves, and office always to the same people, paying most regard to wealth. Thus the rulers are few, and are bad men instead of the most worthy. Democracy passes over into democracy, for these are coterminous, since it is the ideal even of democracy to be the rule of the majority, and all who have the property qualification count as equal. Democracy is the least bad of the deviations, for in its case the form of constitution is but a slight deviation. These then are the changes to which constitutions are most subject, for these are the smallest and easiest transitions. One may find resemblances to these constitutions, and as it were, patterns of them even in households. For the association of a father with his sons bears the form of monarchy, since the father cares for his children. And this is why Homer calls Zeus father. It is the ideal of monarchy to be paternal rule. But among the Persians, the rule of the father is tyrannical. They use their sons as slaves. Tyrannical, too, is the rule of a master over slaves, for it is the advantage of the master that is brought about in it. Now this seems to be a correct form of government, but the Persian type is perverted. For the modes of rule appropriate to different relations are diverse. The association of man and wife seems to be aristocratic, for the man rules in accordance with his worth, and in those matters in which a man should rule, but the matters that befit a woman he hands over to her. If the man rules in everything, the relation passes over into oligarchy, for in doing so he is not acting in accordance with their respective worth, and not ruling in virtue of his superiority. Sometimes, however, women rule, because they are heiresses. So their rule is not in virtue of excellence, but due to wealth and power, as in oligarchies. The association of brothers is like timocracy, for they are equal, except insofar as they differ in age. Hence, if they differ much in age, the friendship is no longer of the fraternal type. Democracy is found chiefly in the masterless dwellings, for here everyone is on an equality. And in those in which the ruler is weak and everyone has license to do as he pleases. Section 11. Each of the constitutions may be seen to involve friendship just in so far as it involves justice. The friendship between a king and his subjects depends on an excess of benefits conferred. For he confers benefits on his subjects if, being a good man, he cares for them with a view to their well-being, as a shepherd does for his sheep, whence Homer called Agamemnon shepherd of the peoples. Such, too, is the friendship of a father, though this exceeds the other in the greatness of the benefits conferred, for he is responsible for the existence of his children, which is thought the greatest good, and for their nurture and upbringing. 
These things are ascribed to ancestors as well. Further, by nature, a father tends to rule over his sons, ancestors over descendants, a king over his subjects. These friendships imply superiority of one party over the other, which is why ancestors are honored. The justice, therefore, that exists between persons so related is not the same on both sides, but is in every case proportioned to merit. For that is true of the friendship as well. The friendship of man and wife, again, is the same that is found in an aristocracy. For it is in accordance with virtue, the better gets more of what is good. And each gets what befits him. And so, too, with the justice in these relations. The friendship of brothers is like that of comrades. For they are equal and of like age. And as such persons are for the most part like in their feelings and their character. Like this, too, is the friendship appropriate to democratic government. For in such a constitution, the ideal is for the citizens to be equal and fair. Therefore, rule is taken in turn, and on equal terms, and the friendship appropriate here will correspond. But in the deviation forms, as justice hardly exists, so too does friendship. It exists least in the worst form. In tyranny, there is little or no friendship. For where there is nothing common to ruler and ruled, there is not friendship either. For there is not justice, for example, between craftsman and tool, soul and body, master and slave. The latter in each case is benefited by that which uses it. But there is no friendship nor justice towards lifeless things. But neither is there friendship towards a horse or an ox, nor to a slave qua slave. For there is nothing common to the two parties. The slave is a living tool, and the tool a lifeless slave. Qua slave, then, one cannot be friends with him. But qua man, one can. For there seems to be some justice between any man and any others who can share in a system of law or be a party to an agreement. Therefore, there can also be friendship with him insofar as he is a man. Therefore, while in tyrannies friendship and justice hardly exist, in democracies they exist more fully. For where the citizens are equal, they have much in common. Section 12. Every form of friendship, then, involves association, as has been said. One might, however, mark off from the rest both the friendship of kindred and that of comrades, those of fellow citizens, fellow tribesmen, fellow voyagers, and the like, are more like mere friendships of association, for they seem to rest on a sort of compact. With them we might class the friendship of host and guest, the friendship of kinsmen itself, while it seems to be of many kinds, appears to depend in every case on parental friendship. For parents love their children as being a part of themselves, and children their parents as being something originating from them. Now, parents know their offspring better than their children know that they are their own children. And the originator feels his offspring to be his own more than the offspring do their begetter. For the product belongs to the producer, for example, a tooth or hair or anything else to him whose it is. But the producer does not belong to the product or belongs in a less degree. And the length of time produces the same result. Parents love their children as soon as these are born, but children love their parents only after time has elapsed and they have acquired understanding or the power of discrimination by the senses. From these considerations, it is also plain why mothers love more than fathers do. Parents, then, love their children as themselves, for their issue are, by virtue of their separate existence, a uh, sort of other selves. While children love their parents as being born of them, and the brothers love each other as being born of the same parents, for their identity with them makes them identical with each other. 
which is the reason why people talk of the same blood, the same stock, and so on. They are therefore, in a sense, the same thing, though in separate individuals. Two things that contribute greatly to friendship are a common upbringing and similarity of age, for two of an age take to each other. And the people brought up together tend to be comrades, whence the friendship of brothers is akin to that of comrades. And cousins and other kinsmen are bound up together by derivation from brothers, vis-a-vis -vis by being derived from the same parents. They come to be closer together or farther apart by virtue of the nearness or distance of the original ancestor. The friendship of children to parents and of men to gods is a relation to them as to something good and superior, for they have conferred the greatest benefits, since they are the causes of their being and of their nourishment, and of their education from their birth. And this kind of friendship possesses pleasantness and utility also, more than that of strangers, inasmuch as their life is lived more in common. The friendship of brothers has the characteristics found in that of comrades, and especially when these are good, and in general between people who are like each other. Inasmuch as they belong more to each other and start with a love for each other from their very birth, and inasmuch as these born of the same parents and brought up together and similarly educated are more akin in character. And the test of time has been applied most fully and convincingly in their cases. Between other kinsmen, friendly relations are found in due proportion. Between man and wife, friendship seems to exist by nature, for man is naturally inclined to form couples even more than to form cities, inasmuch as the household is earlier and more necessary than the city, and reproduction is more common to man with the animals. With the other animals, the union extends only to this point, but human beings live together not only for the sake of reproduction, but also for the various purposes of life. For from the start the functions are divided, and those of man and woman are different. So they help each other by throwing their peculiar gifts into the common stock. It is for these reasons that both utility and pleasure seem to be found in this kind of friendship. But this friendship may be based alone on virtue, if the parties are good. For each has its own virtue, and they will delight in the fact. And children seem to be a bond of union, which is the reason why childless people part more easily. For children are a common good to both, and what is common holds them together. How man and wife, and in general friend and friend, ought mutually to behave seems to be the same question as how it is just for them to behave. For a man does not seem to have the same duties to a friend, a stranger, a comrade, and a schoolfellow. Section 13. There are three kinds of friendship, as we said at the outset of our inquiry and in respect of each, some are friends on an equality, and others by virtue of a superiority. For not only can equally good men become friends, but a better man can make friends with a worse. And similarly, in friendships of pleasure or utility, the friends may be equal or unequal in the benefits they confer. This being so, equals must effect the required equalization on a basis of equality in love and in all other respects, while unequals must render what is in proportion to their superiority or inferiority. Complaints and reproaches arise either only or chiefly in the friendship of utility, and this is only to be expected. For those who are friends on the ground of virtue are anxious to do well by each other, since that is a mark of virtue and of friendship. And between men who are emulating each other, in this there cannot be complaints or quarrels. No one is offended by a man who loves him and does well by him. If he is a person of nice feeling, he takes his revenge by doing well by the other. And the man who excels the other in the services he renders will not complain of his friend. Since he gets what he aims at, for each man desires what is good. Nor do complaints arise much, even in friendships of pleasure, for both get at the same time what they desire, if they enjoy spending their time together. And even a man who complained of another for not affording him pleasure would seem ridiculous, 
since it is in his power not to spend his days with him. But the friendship of utility is full of complaints, for as they use each other for their own interests, they always want to get the better of the bargain, and think they have got less than they should, and blame their partners and because they do not get all they want and deserve, and those who do well by others cannot help them as much as those whom they benefit want. Now it seems that, as justice is of two kinds, one unwritten and the other legal, one kind of friendship of utility is moral and the other legal. And so complaints arise most of all when men do not dissolve their relation in the spirit of the same type of friendship in which they contracted it. The legal type is that which is on fixed terms. Its purely commercial variety is on the basis of immediate payment, while the more liberal variety allows time but stipulates for a definite quid pro quo. In this variety, the debt is clear and not ambiguous, but in the postponement, it contains an element of friendliness. And so some states do not allow suits arising out of such agreements, but think men who have bargained on a basis of credit ought to accept the consequences. The moral type is not on fixed terms. It makes a gift, or does whatever it does, as to a friend. But one expects to receive as much or more, as having not given but lent. And if a man is worse off when the relation is dissolved than he was when it was contracted, he will complain. This happens because all or most men, while they wish for what is noble, choose what is advantageous. Now, it is noble to do well by another without a view to repayment, but it is the receiving of benefits that is advantageous. Therefore, if we can, we should return the equivalent of what we have received, for we must not make a man our friend against his will. We must recognize that we were mistaken at the first and took a benefit from a person we should not have taken it from, since it was not from a friend, nor from one who did it just for the sake of acting so. We must settle up just as if we had been benefited on fixed terms. Indeed, one would agree to repay if one could. If one could not, even the giver would not have expected one to do so. Therefore, if it is possible, we must repay. But at the outset, we must consider the man by whom we are being benefited and on what terms he is acting, in order that we may accept the benefit on these terms or else decline it. It is disputable whether we ought to measure a service by its utility to the receiver and make the return with a view to that, or by the benevolence of the giver. For those who have received say they have received from their benefactors what meant little to the latter and what they might have got from others. Minimizing the service. While the givers, on the contrary, say it was the biggest thing they had and what could not have been got from others and that it was given in times of danger or similar need. Now, if the friendship is one that aims at utility, surely the advantage to the receiver is the measure, for it is he that asks for the service, and the other man helps him on the assumption that he will receive the equivalent. So the assistance has been precisely as great as the advantage to the receiver, and therefore he must return as much as he has received, and even more, for that would be nobler. In friendships based on virtue, on the other hand, complaints do not arise, but the purpose of the doer is a sort of measure, for in purpose lies the essential element of virtue and character. Section 14. Differences arise also in friendships based on superiority, for each expects to get more out of them. But when this happens, the friendship is dissolved. Not only does the better man think he ought to get more, since more should be assigned to a good man, but the more useful similarly expects this. They say a useless man should not get as much as they should, since it becomes an act of public service and not a friendship if the proceeds of the friendship do not answer to the worth of the benefits conferred. For they think that, as in a commercial partnership, those who put more in get more out, so it should be in friendship. But the man who is in a state of need and inferiority makes the opposite claim. They think it is the part of a good friend to help those who are in need. What, they say, is the use of being the good friend of a good man or a powerful man if one is to get nothing out of it? At all events, it seems that each party is justified in his claim, 
and that each should get more out of the friendship than the other. Not more of the same thing, however, but the superior more honor and the inferior more gain. For honor is the prize of virtue and of beneficence, while gain is the assistance required by inferiority. It seems to be so in constitutional arrangements also. The man who contributes nothing good to the common stock is not honored, for what belongs to the public is given to the man who benefits the public, and honor does belong to the public. It is not possible to get wealth from the common stock and at the same time honor, for no one puts up with the smaller share in all things. Therefore, to the man who loses in wealth, they assign honor, and to the man who is willing to be paid, wealth, since the proportion to merit equalizes the parties and preserves the friendship, as we have said. This, then, is also the way in which we should associate with unequals. The man who is benefited in respect of wealth or virtue must give honor in return, repaying what he can. For friendship asks a man to do what he can, not what is proportional to the merits of the case, since that cannot always be done, for example, in honors paid to the gods or to parents. For no one can ever return to them the equivalent of what he gets. But the man who serves them to the utmost of his power is thought to be a good man. This is why it would not seem open to a man to disown his father, though a father may disown his son. Being in debt, he should repay, but there is nothing by doing which a son will have done the equivalent of what he has received, so that he is always in debt. But the creditors can remit a debt, and a father can therefore do so too. At the same time, it is thought that presumably, no one would repudiate a son who is not far gone in wickedness. For apart from the natural friendship of father and son, it is human nature to reject a son's assistance. But the son, if he is wicked, will naturally avoid aiding his father, or not be zealous about it. For most people wish to get benefits, but avoid doing them as the thing unprofitable. So much for these questions. Book 9, Section 1 In all friendships between dissimilars, it is, as we have said, proportion that equalizes the parties and preserves the friendship. For example, in the political form of friendship, the shoemaker gets a return for his shoes in proportion to his worth, and the weaver and all other craftsmen do the same. Now here a common measure has been provided in the form of money, and therefore everything is referred to this and measured by this. But in the friendship of lovers, sometimes the lover complains that his excess of love is not met by love in return, though perhaps there is nothing lovable about him while often the beloved complains that the lover who formerly promised everything now performs nothing. Such incidents happen when the lover loves the beloved for the sake of pleasure, while the beloved loves the lover for the sake of utility, and they do not possess both of the qualities expected of them. If these be the objects of the friendship, it is dissolved when they do not get the things that formed the motives of their love. For each did not love the other person himself, but the qualities he had, and these were not enduring. That is why the friendships are also transient. But the love of characters, as has been said, endures because it is self-dependent. Differences arise when what they get is something different and not what they desire. For it is like getting nothing at all when we do not get what we aim at. Compare the story of the person who made promises to a lyre player, promising him the more, the better he sang. But in the morning, when the other demanded the fulfillment of his promises, said that he had given pleasure for pleasure. Now, if this had been what each wanted, all would have been well. But if the one wanted enjoyment, but the other gain, and the one has what he wants while the other has not, the terms of the association will not have been properly fulfilled. For what each in fact wants is what he attends to, and it is for the sake of that that he will give what he has. But who is to fix the worth of the service? He who makes the sacrifice, or he who has got the advantage? 
At any rate, the other seems to leave it to him. This is what they say Protagoras used to do. Whenever he taught anything whatsoever, he bade the learner assess the value of the knowledge and accepted the amount so fixed. But in such matters, some men approve of the saying, let a man have his fixed reward. Those who get the money first and then do none of the things they said they would, owing to the extravagance of their promises, naturally find themselves the objects of complaint, for they do not fulfill what they agreed to. The sophists are perhaps compelled to do this because no one would give money for the things they do know. These people then, if they do not do what they have been paid for, are naturally made the objects of complaint. But where there is no contract of service, those who give up something for the sake of the other party cannot, as we have said, be complained of, for that is the nature of the friendship of virtue. And the return to them must be made on the basis of their purpose, for it is purpose that is the characteristic thing in a friend and in virtue. And so too, it seems, should one make a return to those with whom one has studied philosophy for their worth cannot be measured against money, and they can get no honor which will balance their services. But still, it is perhaps enough, as it is with the gods and with one's parents, to give them what one can. If the gift was not of this sort, but was made with a view to a return, it is no doubt preferable that the return made should be one that seems fair to both parties, but if this cannot be achieved, it would seem not only necessary that the person who gets the first service should fix the reward, but also just. For if the other gets in return the equivalent of the advantage the beneficiary has received, or the price Lai would have paid for the pleasure, he will have got what is fair as from the other. We see this happening too with things put up for sale. And in some places there are laws providing that no actions shall arise out of voluntary contracts, on the assumption that one should settle with a person to whom one has given credit, in the spirit in which one bargained with him. The law holds that it is more just that the person to whom credit was given should fix the terms than that the person who gave credit should do so. For most things are not assessed at the same value by those who have them and those who want them. Each class values highly what is its own and what it is offering. Yet the return is made on the terms fixed by the receiver. But no doubt the receiver should assess a thing not at what it seems worth when he has it, but at what he assessed it at before he had it. Section 2 a further problem is set by such questions as whether one should in all things give the preference to one's father and obey him, or whether when one is ill one should trust a doctor, and when one has to elect a general should elect a man of military skill, and similarly whether one should render a service by preference to a friend or to a good man, and should show gratitude to a benefactor or oblige a friend if one cannot do both. All such questions are hard, are they not, to decide with precision? For they admit of many variations of all sorts in respect both of the magnitude of the service and of its nobility necessity. But that we should not give the preference in all things to the same person is plain enough and we must, for the most part, return benefits rather than oblige friends. And we must pay back a loan to a creditor rather than make one to a friend. But perhaps even this is not always true. For example, should a man who has been ransomed out of the hands of brigands ransom his ransomer in return, whoever he may be, or pay him if he has not been captured but demands payment, or should he ransom his father? It would seem that he should ransom his father in preference even to himself. As we have said then, generally the debt should be paid, but if the gift is exceedingly noble or exceedingly necessary, one should defer to these considerations. For sometimes it is not even fair to return the equivalent of what one has received, 
when the one man has done a service to whom he knows to be good, while the other makes a return to one whom he believes to be bad. For that matter, one should sometimes not lend in return to one who has lent to oneself. For the one person lent to a good man, expecting to recover his loan, while the other has no hope of recovering from one who is believed to be bad. Therefore, if the facts really are so, the demand is not fair. <laughs> and if they are not, but people think they are, they would be held to be doing nothing strange in refusing. As we have often pointed out then, discussions about feelings and actions have just as much definiteness as their subject matter. That we should not make the same return to everyone, nor give a father the preference in everything, as one does not sacrifice everything to Zeus, is plain enough. But since we ought to render different things to parents, brothers, comrades, and benefactors, we ought to render to each class what is appropriate and becoming. And this is what people seem in fact to do. To marriages they invite their kinsfolk, for these have a part in the family and therefore in the doings that affect the family. And at funerals also they think that kinsfolk, before all others, should meet for the same reason. And it would be thought that in the matter of food we should help our parents before all others, since we owe our own nourishment to them. And it is more honorable to help in this respect the authors of our being even before ourselves. An honor, too, one should give to one's parents as one does to the gods, but not any and every honor. For that matter, one should not give the same honor to one's father and one's mother, nor again should one give them the honor due to a philosopher or to a general, but the honor due to a father or again to a mother. To all older persons, too, one should give honor appropriate to their age, by rising to receive them and finding seats for them, and so on. While to comrades and brothers one should allow freedom of speech and common use of all things. Kinsmen, too, and fellow tribesmen and fellow citizens, and to every other class one should always try to assign what is appropriate, and to compare the claims of each class with respect to nearness of relation and to virtue or usefulness. The comparison is easier when the persons belong to the same class, and more laborious when they are different. Yet we must not on that account shrink from the task, but decide the question as best we can. Section 3. Another question that arises is whether friendships should or should not be broken off when the other party does not remain the same. Perhaps we may say that there is nothing strange in breaking off a friendship based on utility or pleasure when our friends no longer have these attributes. For it was of these attributes that we were the friends, and when these have failed it is reasonable to love no longer. But one might complain of another if, when he loved us for our usefulness or pleasantness, he pretended to love us for our character. For, as we said at the outset, most differences arise between friends when they are not friends in the spirit in which they think they are. So, when a man has deceived himself and has thought he was being loved for his character, when the other person was doing nothing of the kind, he must blame himself. When he has been deceived by the pretenses of the other person, it is just that he should complain against his deceiver. He will complain with more justice than one does against people who counterfeit the currency, inasmuch as the wrongdoing is concerned with something more valuable. But if one accepts another man as good, and he turns out badly, and is seen to do so, must one still love him? Surely it is impossible, since not everything can be loved, but only what is good. What is evil neither can nor should be loved, for it is not one's duty to be a lover of evil, nor to become like what is bad, and we have said that like is dear like. Must the friendship then be forthwith broken off? Or is this not so in all cases, but only when one's friends are incurable in their wickedness? If they are capable of being reformed, one should rather come to the assistance of their character or their property, inasmuch as this is better and more characteristic of friendship. But a man who breaks off such a friendship would seem to be doing nothing strange, 
for it was not to a man of this sort that he was a friend. When his friend has changed, therefore, and he is unable to save him, he gives him up. But if one friend remained the same while the other became better and far outstripped him in virtue, should the latter treat the former as a friend? Surely he cannot. When the interval is great, this becomes most plain, for example, in the case of childish friendships. If one friend remained a child in intellect while the other became a fully developed man, how could they be friends when they neither approved of the same things nor delighted in and were pained by the same things? For not even with regard to each other will their tastes agree, and without this, as we saw, they cannot be friends, for they cannot live together. But we have discussed these matters. Should he then behave no otherwise towards him than he would if he had never been his friend? Surely he should keep a remembrance of their former intimacy. And as we think we ought to oblige friends rather than strangers, so to those who have been our friends we ought to make some allowance for our former friendship, when the breach has not been due to excess of wickedness. Section 4. Friendly relations with one's neighbors and the marks by which friendships are defined seem to have proceeded from a man's relations to himself. For we define a friend as one who wishes and does what is good or seems so for the sake of his friend, or as one who wishes his friend to exist and live for his sake, which mothers do to their children and friends do who have come into conflict. And others define him as one who lives with and has the same tastes as another, or one who grieves and rejoices with his friend, and this too is found in mothers, most of all. It is by some one of these characteristics that friendship too is defined. Now each of these is true of the good man's relation to himself, and of all other men, insofar as they think themselves good. Virtue and the good man seem, as has been said, to be the measure of every class of things. For his opinions are harmonious, and he desires the same things with all his soul, and therefore he wishes for himself what is good and what seems so, and does it, for it is characteristic of the good man to work out the good, and does so for his own sake, for he does it for the sake of the intellectual element in him, which is thought to be the man himself, and he wishes himself to live and be preserved, and especially the element by virtue of which he thinks. For existence is good to the virtuous man, and each man wishes himself what is good, while no one chooses to possess the whole world if he is first to become someone else. For that matter, even now God possesses the good. He wishes for this only on condition of being whatever he is, and the element that thinks would seem to be the individual man, or to be so more than any other element in him. And such a man wishes to live with himself, for he does so with pleasure, since the memories of his past acts are delightful, and his hopes for the future are good, and therefore pleasant. His mind is well stored, too, with subjects of contemplation, and he grieves and rejoices more than any other with himself. For the same thing is always painful, and the same thing is always pleasant, and not one thing at one time and another at another. He has, so to speak, nothing to repent of. Therefore, since each of these characteristics belongs to the good man in relation to himself, and he is related to his friend as to himself, for his friend is another self, friendship, too, is thought to be one of these attributes, and those who have these attributes to be friends. Whether there is or is not friendship between a man and himself is a question we may dismiss for the present. There would seem to be friendship insofar as he is two or more, to judge from the aforementioned attributes of friendship, and from the fact that the extreme of friendship is likened to one's love for oneself. But the attributes named seem to belong even to the majority of men, poor creatures though they may be. Are we to say then that insofar as they are satisfied with themselves and think they are good, they share in these attributes? Certainly no one who is thoroughly bad and impious has these attributes or even seems to do so. They hardly belong even to inferior people, for they are at variance with themselves and have appetites for some things and rational desires for others. This is true, for instance, of incontinent people, 
for they choose, instead of the things they think themselves good, things that are pleasant but hurtful. While others, again, through cowardice and laziness, shrink from doing what they think best for themselves. And those who have done many terrible deeds and are hated for their wickedness even shrink from life and destroy themselves. And wicked men seek for people with whom to spend their days and shun themselves, for they remember many a grievous deed and anticipate others like them when they are by themselves, but when they are with others they forget. And having nothing lovable in them, they have no feeling of love to themselves. Therefore also such men do not rejoice or grieve with themselves, for their soul is rent by faction, and one element in it, by reason of its wickedness, grieves when it abstains from certain acts, while the other part is pleased, and one draws them this way and the other that, as if they were pulling them in pieces. If a man cannot at the same time be pained and pleased, at all events, after a short time, he is pained because he was pleased, and he could have wished that these things had not been pleasant to him, for bad men are laden with repentance. Therefore the bad man does not seem to be amicably disposed even to himself, because there is nothing in him to love. So that if to be thus is the height of wretchedness, we should strain every nerve to avoid wickedness and should endeavor to be good. For so, and only so, can be one either friendly to oneself or a friend to another. Section 5. Goodwill is a friendly sort of relation, but is not identical with friendship. For one may have goodwill both towards people whom one does not know, and without their knowing it, but not friendship. This has indeed already been said. But goodwill is not even friendly feeling, for it does not involve intensity or desire whereas these accompany friendly feeling. And friendly feeling implies intimacy, while goodwill may arise of a sudden, as it does towards competitors in a contest. We come to feel goodwill for them and to share in their wishes, but we would not do anything with them. For as we said, we feel goodwill suddenly and love them only superficially. Goodwill seems then to be a beginning of friendship, as the pleasure of the eye is the beginning of love. For no one loves if he has not first been delighted by the form of the beloved. But he who delights in the form of another does not, for all that, love him, but only does so when he also longs for him, when absent and craves for his presence. So too it is not possible for people to be friends if they have not come to feel goodwill for each other. But those who feel goodwill are not, for all that, friends. For they only wish well to those for whom they feel goodwill, it would not do anything with them nor take trouble for them. And so one might, by an extension of the term friendship, say that goodwill is inactive friendship. Though when it is prolonged and reaches the point of intimacy, it becomes friendship. Not the friendship based on utility, nor that based on pleasure. For goodwill, too, does not arise on those terms. The man who has received a benefit bestows goodwill in return for what has been done to him but in doing so is only doing what is just, while he who wishes someone to prosper because he hopes for enrichment through him seems to have goodwill not to him, but rather to himself, just as a man is not a friend to another if he cherishes him for the sake of some use to be made of him. In general, goodwill arises on account of some excellence and worth. When one man seems to another beautiful or brave or something of the sort, as we pointed out in the case of competitors in a contest. Section 6. Unanimity also seems to be a friendly relation. For this reason, it is not identity of opinion. For that might occur even with people who do not know each other. Nor do we say that people who have the same views on any and every subject are unanimous. For example, those who agree about the heavenly bodies, for unanimity about these is not a friendly relation. But we do say that a city is unanimous when men have the same opinion about what is to their interest, and choose the same actions, and do what they have resolved in common. It is about these things to be done, therefore, that people are said to be unanimous, and among these, about matters of consequence and in which it is possible for both or all parties to get what they want. For example, a city is unanimous when all its citizens think that the offices in it should be elective. 
or that they should form an alliance with Sparta, or that Pittacus should be their ruler, at a time when he himself was also willing to rule. But when each of two people wishes himself to have the same thing in question, like the captains in the Phonisai, they are in a state of faction, for it is not unanimity when each of the two parties thinks of the same thing, whatever that may be, but only when they think of the same thing in the same hands. For example, when both the common people and those of the better class wish the best men to rule, for thus and thus alone do all get what they aim at. Unanimity seems then to be political friendship, as indeed it is commonly said to be, for it is concerned with things that are to our interest and have an influence on our life. Now such unanimity is found among good men, for they are unanimous both in themselves and with one another, being, so to say, of one mind. For the wishes of such men are constant and not at the mercy of opposing currents like a strait of the sea. And they wish for what is just and what is advantageous, and these are the objects of their common endeavor as well. But bad men cannot be unanimous except to a small extent, any more than they can be friends, since they aim at getting more than their share of advantages. While in labor and public service they fall short of their share, and each man wishing for advantage to himself criticizes his neighbor and stands in his way. For if people do not watch it carefully, the common wheel is soon destroyed. The result is that they are in a state of faction, putting compulsion on each other, but unwilling themselves to do what is just. Section 7. Benefactors are thought to love those who they have benefited more than those who have been well treated, love those who have treated them well. And this is discussed as though it were paradoxical. Most people think it is because the latter are in the position of debtors and the former of creditors, and therefore, as in the case of loans, debtors wish the creditors did not exist, while creditors actually take care of the safeties of their debtors. So it is thought that benefactors wish the objects of their action to exist since they will then get their gratitude, while the beneficiaries take no interest in making this return. Epicharmus would perhaps declare that they say this because they look at things on their bad side, but it is quite like human nature. For most people are forgetful and are more anxious to be well treated than to treat others well. But the cause would seem to be more deeply rooted in the nature of things. The case of those who have lent money is not even analogous. For they have no friendly feeling to their debtors, but only a wish that they may be kept safe with a view to what is to be got from them. While those who have done a service to others feel friendship and love for those they have served, even if they're not of any use to them and never will be. This is what happens with craftsmen, too. Every man loves his own handiwork better than he would be loved by it if it came alive. And this happens perhaps most of all with poets, for they have an excessive love for their own poems, doting on them as if they were their children. This is what the position of benefactors is like, for that which they have treated well is their handiwork, and therefore they love this more than the handiwork does its maker. The cause of this is that existence is to all men a thing to be chosen and loved, and that we exist by virtue of activity, in other words, by living and acting, and that the handiwork is, in a sense, the producer in activity. He loves his handiwork, therefore, because he loves existence. And this is rooted in the nature of things, for what he is in potentiality, his handiwork manifests in activity. At the same time, to the benefactor, that is noble, which depends on his action, so that he delights in the object of his action. Whereas to the patient, there is nothing noble in the agent, but at most something advantageous, and this is less pleasant and lovable. What is pleasant is the activity of the present, the hope of the future, the memory of the past. But most pleasant is that which depends on activity. And similarly, this is most lovable. Now, for a man who has made something, his work remains, for the noble is lasting, but for the person acted on, the utility passes away. And the memory of noble things is pleasant, but that of useful things, 
is not likely to be pleasant, or is less so, though the reverse seems true of expectation. Further, love is like activity, being loved like passivity, and loving and its concomitants are attributes of those who are the more active. Again, all men love more what they have won by labor. For example, those who have made their money love it more than those who have inherited it. And to be well treated seems to involve no labor, while to treat others well is a laborious task. These are the reasons, too, why mothers are fonder of their children than fathers. Bringing them into the world costs them more pains, and they know better that the children are their own. This last point, too, would seem to apply to benefactors. Section 8. The question is also debated whether a man should love himself most or someone else. People criticize those who love themselves most and call themselves lovers, using this as an epithet of disgrace. And a bad man seems to do everything for his own sake, and the more so, the more wicked he is. And so men reproach him, for instance, with doing nothing of his own accord, while the good man acts for honor's sake, and the more so, the better he is, and acts for his friend's sake and sacrifices his own interest. But the facts clash with these arguments, and this is not surprising. For men say that one ought to love best one's best friend, and man's best friend is one who wishes well to the object of his wish for his sake, even if no one is to know of it. And these attributes are found most of all in a man's attitude towards himself, and so are all the other attributes by which a friend is defined. For, as we have said, it is from this relation that all the characteristics of friendship have extended to our neighbors. All the proverbs, too, agree with this. For example, a single soul, and what friends have is common property, and friendship is equality, and charity begins at home. For all these marks will be found most in a man's relation to himself. He is his own best friend, and therefore ought to love himself best. It is therefore a reasonable question which of the two views we should follow, for both are plausible. Perhaps we ought to mark off such arguments from each other and determine how far and in what respects each view is right. Now, if we grasp the sense in which each school uses the phrase lover of self, the truth may become evident. Those who use the term as one of reproach ascribe self-love to people who assign to themselves the greater share of wealth, honors, and bodily pleasures. For these are what most people desire, and busy themselves about as though they were the best of all things, which is the reason, too, why they become objects of competition. So those who are grasping with regard to these things gratify their appetites, and in general, their feelings and the irrational element of the soul, and most men are of this nature which is the reason why the epithet has come to be used as it is. It takes its meaning from the prevailing type of self-love, which is a bad one. It is just, therefore, that men who are lovers of self in this way are reproached for being so. That it is those who give themselves the preference in regard to objects of this sort that most people usually call lovers of self is plain. For if a man were always anxious that he himself, above all things, should act justly, temperately, or in accordance with any other of the virtues, and in general were always to try to secure for himself the honorable course, no one will call such a man a lover of self or blame him. But such a man would seem more than the other a lover of self. At all events, he assigns to himself the things that are noblest and best and gratifies the most authoritative element, in and in all things obeys this. And just as a city or any other systematic whole is most properly identified with the most authoritative element in it, so is a man. And therefore, the man who loves this and gratifies it is most of all a lover of self. Besides, a man is said to have or not to have self-control, according as his reason has or has not the control, on the assumption that this is the man himself. And the things men have done on a rational principle are thought most properly their own acts and voluntary acts. That this is the man himself, then, or is so more than anything else, is plain, and also that the good man loves most this part of him. 
whence it follows that he is most truly a lover of self, of another type than that which is a matter of reproach, and as different from that as living according to a rational principle is from living as passion dictates, and desiring what is noble from desiring what seems advantageous. Those, then, who busy themselves in an exceptional degree with noble actions, all men approve and praise. And if all were to strive towards what is noble, and strain every nerve to do the noblest deeds, everything would be as it should be for the common weal. And every one should secure for himself the goods that are greatest, since virtue is the greatest of goods. Therefore the good man should be a lover of self, for he will both himself profit by doing noble acts and will benefit his fellows. But the wicked man should not, for he will hurt both himself and his neighbors, following as he does his evil passions. For the wicked man, what he does clashes with what he ought to do, but what the good man ought to do he does. For reason in each of its possessors chooses what is best for itself, and the good man obeys his reason. It is true of the good man, too, that he does many acts for the sake of his friends and his country, and if necessary dies for them. For he will throw away both wealth and honors, and in general the goods that are objects of competition, gaining for himself nobility, since he would prefer a short period of intense pleasure to a long one of mild enjoyment, a twelve month of noble life to many years of humdrum existence, and one great and noble action to many trivial ones. Now those who die for others doubtless attain this result. It is therefore a great prize that they choose for themselves. They will throw away wealth, too, on condition that their friends will gain more. For while a man's friend gains wealth, he himself achieves nobility. He is therefore assigning the greater good to himself. The same, too, is true of honor and office. All these things he will sacrifice to his friend, for this is noble and laudable for himself. Rightly, then, is he thought to be good, since he chooses nobility before all else. But he may even give up actions to his friend. It may be nobler to become the cause of his friend's acting than to act himself. In all the actions, therefore, that men are praised for, the good man is seen to assign to himself the greater share in what is noble. In this sense, then, as has been said, a man should be a lover of self. But in the sense in which most men are so, he ought not. Section 9. It is also disputed whether the happy man will need friends or not. It is said that those who are supremely happy and self-sufficient have no need of friends. For they have the things that are good, and therefore being self-sufficient, they need nothing further. While a friend, being another self, furnishes what a man cannot provide by his own effort. Whence the saying, when fortune is kind, what need of friends? But it seems strange, when one assigns all good things to the happy man, not to assign friends who are thought the greatest of external goods. And if it is more characteristic of a friend to do well by another than to be well done by, and to confer benefits is characteristic of the good man and of virtue, and it is nobler to do well by friends than by strangers, the good man will need people to do well by. This is why the question is asked whether we need friends more in prosperity or in adversity, on the assumption that not only does a man in adversity need people to confer benefits on him, but also those who are prospering need people to do well by. Surely it is strange, too, to make the supremely happy man a solitary, for no one would choose the whole world on condition of being alone, since man is a political creature and one whose nature is to live with others. Therefore, even the happy man lives with others, for he has the things that are by nature good. And plainly, it is better to spend his days with friends and good men than with strangers or any chance persons. Therefore, the happy man needs friends. What then is it that the first school means? And in what respect is it right? Is it that most identify friends with useful people? Of such friends, indeed, the supremely happy man will have no need, since he already has the things that are good. Nor will he need those whom one makes one's friends because of their pleasantness, 
or he will need them only to a small extent, for his life, being pleasant, has no need of adventitious pleasure. And because he does not need such friends, he is thought not to need friends. But that is surely not true. For we have said at the outset that happiness is an activity. An activity plainly comes into being and is not present at the start, like a piece of property. If happiness lies in living and being an active, and the good man's activity is virtuous and pleasant in itself, as we have said at the outset, and a thing's being one's own is one of the attributes that make it pleasant, and we can contemplate our neighbors better than ourselves and their actions better than our own, and if the actions of virtuous men who are their friends are pleasant to good men, since these have both the attributes that are naturally pleasant, if this be so, the supremely happy man will need friends of this sort. Since his purpose is to contemplate worthy actions and actions that are his own, and the actions of a good man who is his friend have both these qualities. Further, men think that the happy man ought to live pleasantly. Now, if he were a solitary, life would be hard for him. For by oneself, it is not easy to be continuously active. But with others and towards others, it is easier. With others, therefore, his activity will be more continuous, and it is in itself pleasant, as it ought to be for the man who is supremely happy. For a good man, quite good, delights in virtuous actions and is vexed at vicious ones, as a musical man enjoys beautiful tunes but is pained at bad ones. A certain training in virtue arises also from the company of the good, as Theognis has said before us. If we look deeper into the nature of things, a virtuous friend seems to be naturally desirable for a virtuous man. For that which is good by nature, we have said, is for the virtuous man good and pleasant in itself. Now life is defined in the case of animals by the power of perception in that of man, by the power of perception or thought. And a power is defined by reference to the corresponding activity, which is the essential thing. Therefore, life seems to be essentially the act of perceiving or thinking. And life is among the things that are good and pleasant in themselves, since it is determinate, and the determinate is of the nature of the good. And that which is good by nature is also good for the virtuous man, which is the reason why life seems pleasant to all men. But we must not apply this to a wicked and corrupt life, nor to a life spent in pain for such a life is indeterminate, as are its attributes. The nature of pain will become plainer in what follows. But if life itself is good and pleasant, which it seems to be, from the very fact that all men desire it, and particularly those who are good and supremely happy, for to such men life is most desirable, and their existence is the most supremely happy. And if he who sees perceives that he sees, and he who hears that he hears, and he who walks that he walks, and in the case of all other activities there is something which perceives that we are active, so that if we perceive, we perceive that we perceive, and if we think that we think, and if to perceive that we perceive or think is to perceive that we exist, for existence was defined as perceiving or thinking, and if perceiving that one lives is in what itself one of the things that are pleasant, for life is by nature good, and to perceive what is good present in oneself is pleasant. And if life is desirable, and particularly so for good men, because to them existence is good and pleasant, for they are pleased at the consciousness of the presence in them of what is in itself good, and if as the virtuous man is to himself, he is to his friend also, for his friend is another self. If all this be true, as his own being is desirable for each man, so, or almost so, is that of his friend. Now his being was seen to be desirable because he perceived his own goodness, and such perception is pleasant in itself. He needs, therefore, to be conscious of the existence of his friend as well, and this will be realized in their living together and sharing in discussion and thought. For this is what living together would seem to mean in the case of man, and not, as in the case of cattle, feeding in the same place. 
If then, being is in itself desirable for the supremely happy man, since it is by its nature good and pleasant, and that of his friend is very much the same, a friend will be one of the things that are desirable. Now that which is desirable for him he must have, or he will be deficient in this respect. The man who is to be happy will therefore need virtuous friends. Section 10. Should we then make as many friends as possible, or as in the case of hospitality it is thought to be suitable advice, that one should be neither a man of many guests nor a man with none? Will that apply to friendship as well? Should a man neither be friendless nor have an excessive number of friends? To friends made with a view to utility, this seeing would seem thoroughly applicable. For to do services to many people in return is a laborious task, and life is not long enough for its performance. Therefore, friends in excess of those who are sufficient for our own life are superfluous and hindrances to the noble life, so that we have no need of them. Of friends made with a view to pleasure, also, few are enough as a little seasoning in food is enough. But as regards good friends, should we have as many as possible? Or is there a limit to the number of one's friends, as there is to the size of a city? You cannot make a city of ten men, and if there are a hundred thousand, it is a city no longer. But the proper number is presumably not a single number, but anything that falls between certain fixed points. So, for friends, too, there is a fixed number, perhaps the largest number with whom one can live together. For that, we found thought to be very characteristic of friendship. And that one cannot live with many people and divide oneself up among them is plain. Further, there, too, must be friends of one another, if they are all to spend their days together. And it is a hard business for this condition to be fulfilled with a large number. It is found difficult, too, to rejoice and to grieve in an intimate way with many people, for it may likely happen that one has at once to be happy with one friend and to mourn with another. Presumably, then, it is well not to seek to have as many friends as possible, but as many as are enough for the purpose of living together, for it would seem actually impossible to be a great friend to many people. This is why one cannot love several people. Love is ideally a sort of excess of friendship, and that can only be felt towards one person. Therefore, great friendship, too, can only be felt towards a few people. This seems to be confirmed in practice, for we do not find many people who are friends in the camaraderie way of friendship. And the famous friendships of this sort are always between two people. Those who have many friends and mixed intimately with them all are thought to be no one's friend, except in the way proper to fellow citizens, and such people are also called obsequious. In the way proper to fellow citizens, indeed, it is possible to be the friend of many and yet not be obsequious, but a genuinely good man. But one cannot have with many people the friendship based on virtue and on the character of our friends themselves, and we must be content if we find even a few such. Section 11. Do we need friends more in good fortune or in bad? They are sought after in both, for while men in adversity need help, in prosperity they need people to live with and to make the objects of their beneficence for they wish to do well by others. Friendship, then, is more necessary in bad fortune, and so it is useful friends that one wants in this case. But it is more noble in good fortune, and so we also seek for good men as our friends, since it is more desirable to confer benefits on these and to live with these. For the very presence of friends is pleasant both in good fortune and also in bad since grief is lightened when friends sorrow with us. Hence one might ask whether they share, as it were, our burden, or without that happening, their presence by its pleasantness, and the thought of their grieving with us make our pain less. Whether it is for these reasons or for some other that our grief is lightened is a question that may be dismissed. At all events, what we have described appears to take place. 
but their presence seems to contain a mixture of various factors. The very seeing of one's friends is pleasant, especially if one is in adversity, and becomes a safeguard against grief. For a friend tends to comfort us, both by the sight of him and by his words, if he is tactful, since he knows our character and the things that please or pain us. But to see him pained at our misfortunes is painful, for every one shuns being a cause of pain to his friends. For this reason, people of a manly nature guard against making their friends grieve with them, and unless he be exceptionally insensible to pain, such a man cannot stand the pain that ensues for his friends, and in general does not admit fellow mourners, because he is not himself given to mourning. But women and womanly men enjoy sympathizers in their grief, and love them as friends and companions in sorrow. But in all things, one obviously ought to imitate the better type of person. On the other hand, the presence of friends in our prosperity implies both the pleasant passing of our time and the pleasant thought of their pleasure at our own good fortune. For this cause, it would seem that we ought to summon our friends readily to share our good fortunes, for the beneficent character is a noble one, but summon them to our bad fortunes with hesitation, for we ought to give them as little a share as possible in our evils, whence the saying, enough is my misfortune. We should summon friends to us most of all when they are likely, by suffering a few inconveniences, to do us a great service. Conversely, it is fitting to go unasked and readily to the aid of those in adversity. For it is characteristic of a friend to render services, and especially to those who are in need and have not demanded them. Such action is nobler and pleasanter for both persons. But when our friends are prosperous, we should join readily in their activities. For they need friends for these too, but be tardy in coming forward to be the objects of their kindness, for it is not noble to be keen to receive benefits. Still, we must no doubt avoid getting the reputation of killjoys by repulsing them, for that sometimes happens. The presence of friends then seems desirable in all circumstances. Section 12. Does it not follow, then, as for lovers, the sight of the beloved is the thing they love most? And they prefer this sense to the others because on it love depends most for its being and for its origin. So for friends, the most desirable thing is living together. For friendship is a partnership, and as a man is to himself, so is he to his friend. Now in his own case, the consciousness of his being is desirable, and so therefore is the consciousness of his friend's being. And the activity of this consciousness is produced when they live together so that it is natural that they aim at this. And whatever existence means for each class of men, whatever it is for whose sake they value life, and that they wish to occupy themselves with their friends, and so some drink together, others dice together, others join in athletic exercises and hunting, or in the study of philosophy, each class spending their days together in whatever they love most in life. For since they wish to live with their friends, they do and share in those things which give them the sense of living together. Thus the friendship of bad men turns out to be an evil thing, for because of their instability, they unite in bad pursuits, and besides, they become evil by becoming like each other. While the friendship of good men is good, being augmented by their companionship, and they are thought to become better too by their activities and by improving each other. For from each other they take the mold of the characteristics they approve, whence the saying noble deeds from noble men. So much then for friendship. Our next task must be to discuss pleasure. Book 10, Section 1. After these matters, we ought perhaps next to discuss pleasure. For it is thought to be most intimately connected with our human nature which is the reason why, in educating the young, we steer them by the rudders of pleasure and pain. It is thought, too, that to enjoy the things we ought, and to hate the things we ought, has the greatest bearing on virtue of character. For these things extend right through life, with a weight and power of their own, 
in respect both to virtue and to the happy life, since men choose what is pleasant and avoid what is painful. And such things, it will be thought, we should least of all omit to discuss, especially since they admit of much dispute. For some say pleasure is the good, while others, on the contrary, say it is thoroughly bad. Some, no doubt, being persuaded that the facts are so, and others thinking it has a better effect on our life to exhibit pleasure as a bad thing, even if it is not. For most people, they think, incline towards it and are the slaves of their pleasures, for which reason they ought to lead them in the opposite direction, since thus they will reach the middle state. But surely this is not correct, for arguments about matters concerned with feelings and actions are less reliable than facts. And so when they clash with the facts of perception, they are despised, and discredit the truth as well. If a man who runs down pleasure is once seen to be aiming at it, his inclining towards it is thought to imply that it is all worthy of being aimed at. For most people are not good at drawing distinctions. True arguments seem, then, most useful, not only with a view to knowledge, but with a view to life also. For since they harmonize with the facts, they are believed. And so they stimulate those who understand them to live according to them. Enough of such questions. Let us proceed to review the opinions that have been expressed about pleasure. Section 2. Eudoxus thought pleasure was the good because he saw all things, both rational and irrational, aiming at it, and because in all things that which is the object of choice is what is excellent, and that which is the object of choice the greatest good. Thus the fact that all things moved toward the same object indicated that this was for all things the chief good. For each thing, he argued, find its own good as it finds its own nourishment. And that which is good for all things, and at which all aim, was the good. His arguments were credited more because of the excellence of his character than for their own sake. He was thought to be remarkably self-controlled, and therefore it was thought that he was not saying what he did say as a friend of pleasure, but that the facts really were so. He believed that the same conclusion followed no less plainly from a study of the contrary of pleasure. Pain was in itself an object of aversion to all things, and therefore its contrary must be similarly an object of choice. And again, that is most an object of choice, which we choose not because or for the sake of something else, and pleasure is admittedly of this nature. For no one asks to what end he is pleased, thus implying that pleasure in, in itself is an object of choice. Further, he argued that pleasure when added to any good, for example to just or temperate action, makes it more worthy of choice, and that it is only by itself that the good can be increased. This argument seems to show it to be one of the goods, and no more a good than any other. For every good is more worthy of choice along with another good than taken alone. And so it is by an argument of this kind that Plato proves the good not to be pleasure. He argues that the pleasant life is more desirable with wisdom than without, and that if the mixture is better, pleasure is not the good, for the good cannot become more desirable by the addition of anything to it. Now, it is clear that nothing else, any more than pleasure, can be the good if it is made more desirable by the addition of any of the things that are good in themselves. What, then, is there that satisfies this criterion, which at the same time we can participate in? It is something of this sort that we are looking for. Those who object that that at which all things aim is not necessarily good are, we may surmise, talking nonsense. For we say that that which everyone thinks really is so, and the man who attacks this belief will hardly have anything more credible to maintain instead. If it is senseless creatures that desire the things in question, there might be something in what they say, 
But if intelligent creatures do so as well, what sense can there be in this view? But perhaps even in inferior creatures, there is some natural good stronger than themselves which aims at their proper good. Nor does the argument about the contrary of pleasure seem to be correct. They say that if pain is an evil, it does not follow that pleasure is a good. For evil is opposed to evil, and at the same time, both are opposed to the neutral state which is correct enough, but does not apply to the things in question. For if both pleasure and pain belonged to the class of evils, they ought both to be objects of aversion. While if they belonged to the class of neutrals, neither should be an object of aversion, or they should both be equally so. But in fact, people evidently avoid the one as evil and choose the other as good. That, then, must be the nature of the opposition between them. Section 3. Nor, again, if pleasure is not a quality, does it follow that it is not a good? For the activities of virtue are not qualities either, nor is happiness. They say, however, that the good is determinate, while pleasure is indeterminate, because it admits of degrees. Now, if it is from the feeling of pleasure that they judge thus, the same will be true of justice and the other virtues, in respect of which we plainly say that people of a certain character are so more or less, and act more or less in accordance with these virtues. For people may be more just or brave, and it is possible also to act justly or temperately more or less. But if their judgment is based on the various pleasures, surely they are not stating the real cause if in fact some pleasures are unmixed and others mixed. Again, just as health admits of degrees without being indeterminate, why should not pleasure? The same proportion is not found in all things, nor a single proportion always in the same thing, but it may be relaxed and yet persist up to a point, and it may differ in degree. The case of pleasure also may therefore be of this kind. Again, they assume that the good is perfect, while movements and comings into being are imperfect, and try to exhibit pleasure as being a movement and a coming into being. But they do not seem to be right even in saying that it is a movement, for speed and slowness are thought to be proper to every movement, and if a movement, for example, that of the heavens, has not speed or slowness in itself, it has it in relation to something else. But of pleasure, neither of these things is true. For while we may become pleased quickly, as we may become angry quickly, we cannot be pleased quickly, not even in relation to someone else, while we can walk or grow or the like quickly. While then we can change quickly or slowly into a state of pleasure, we cannot quickly exhibit the activity of pleasure, in other words, be pleased. Again, how can it be a coming into being? It is not thought that any chance thing can come out of any chance thing, but that a thing is dissolved into that out of which it comes into being. And the pain would be the destruction of that of which pleasure is the coming into being. They say, too, that pain is the lack of that which is according to nature and pleasure is replenishment. But these experiences are bodily. If then pleasure is replenishment with that which is according to nature, that which feels pleasure will be that in which the replenishment takes place, in other words, the body. But that is not thought to be the case. Therefore, the replenishment is not pleasure, though one would be pleased when replenishment was taking place just as one would be pained if one was being operated on. This opinion seems to be based on the pains and the pleasures connected with nutrition, on the fact that when people have been short of food and have felt pain beforehand, they are pleased by the replenishment. But this does not happen with all pleasures, for the pleasures of learning and among the sensuous pleasures, those of smell, and also many sounds and sights and memories and hopes do not presuppose pain. 
Of what, then, will these be the coming into being? There has not been lack of anything of which they could be the supplying anew. In reply to those who bring forward the disgraceful pleasures, one may say that these are not pleasant. If things are pleasant to people of vicious constitution, we must not suppose that they are also pleasant to others than these, just as we do not reason so about the things that are wholesome or sweet or bitter to sick people, or ascribe whiteness to the things that seem white to those suffering from a disease of the eye. Or one might answer thus, that the pleasures are desirable, but not from these sources, as wealth is desirable, but not as the reward of betrayal and health, but not at the cost of eating anything and everything. Or perhaps pleasures differ in kind, for those derived from noble sources are different from those derived from base sources, and one cannot have the pleasure of the just man without being just, nor that of the musical man without being musical, and so on. The fact, too, that a friend is different from a flatterer seems to make it plain that pleasure is not a good or that pleasures are different in kind. For the one is thought to consort with us with a view to the good, the other with a view to our pleasure. And the one is reproached for his conduct, while the other is praised on the ground that he consorts with us for different ends. And no one would choose to live with the intellect of a child throughout his life however much he were to be pleased at the things that children are pleased at, nor to get enjoyment by doing some most disgraceful deed, though he were never to feel any pain in consequence. And there are many things we should be keen about, even if they brought no pleasure. For example, seeing, remembering, knowing, possessing the virtues. If pleasures necessarily do accompany these, that makes no odds. We should choose these even if no pleasure resulted. It seems to be clear, then, that neither is pleasure the good, nor is all pleasure desirable, and that some pleasures are desirable in themselves, differing in kind or in their sources from the others. So much for the things that are said about pleasure and pain. Section 4. What pleasure is, or what kind of thing it is, will become plainer if we take up the question again from the beginning. Singing seems to be at any moment complete, for it does not lack anything, which coming into being later will complete its form. And pleasure also seems to be of this nature, for it is a whole, and at no time can one find a pleasure whose form will be completed if the pleasure lasts longer. For this reason, too, it is not a movement, for every movement, for example that of building, takes time and is for the sake of an end, and is complete when it has made what it aims at. It is complete, therefore, only in the whole time, or at that final movement. In their parts and during the time they occupy, all movements are incomplete, and are different in kind from the whole movement and from each other. For the fitting together of the stones is different from the fluting of the column, and these are both different from the making of the temple. And the making of the temple is complete, for it lacks nothing with a view to the end proposed. But the making of the base or of the triglyph is incomplete, for each is the making of only a part. They differ in kind, then, and it is not possible to find at any and every time of movement complete in form but if at all, only in the whole time. So, too, in the case of walking and all other movements. For if locomotion is a movement from to there, it, too, has differences in kind, flying, walking, leaping, and so on. And not only so, but in walking itself there are such differences. From the whence and whither are not the same in the whole race course and in a part of it nor in one part and in another, nor is it the same thing to traverse this line and that. For one traverses not only a line, but one which is in a place, and this one is in a different place from that. We have discussed movement with precision in another work, 
but it seems that it is not complete at any and every time, but that the many movements are incomplete and different in kind, since the whence and whither give them their form. But of pleasure the form is complete at any and every time. Plainly, then, pleasure and movement must be different from each other, and pleasure must be one of the things that are whole and complete. This would seem to be the case, too, from the fact that it is not possible to move otherwise than in time, but it is possible to be pleased, for that which takes place in a moment is a whole. From these considerations it is clear, too, that these thinkers are not right in saying there is a movement or a coming into being of pleasure. For these cannot be ascribed to all things, but only to those that are divisible and not wholes. There is no coming into being of seeing, nor of a point, nor of a unit, nor is any of these a movement or coming into being. Therefore there is no movement or coming into being of pleasure either, for it is a whole. Since every sense is active in relation to its object, and a sense which is in good condition acts perfectly in relation to the most beautiful of its objects, for perfect activity seems to be ideally of this nature, whether we say that it is active or the organ in which it resides may be assumed to be immaterial. It follows that, in the case of each sense, the best activity is that of the best conditioned organ in relation to the finest of its objects, and this activity will be the most complete and pleasant. For while there is pleasure in respect of any sense, and in respect of thought and contemplation no less, the most complete is pleasantest, and that of a well-conditioned organ in relation to the worthiest of its objects is the most complete and the pleasure completes the activity. But the pleasure does not complete it in the same way as the combination of object and sense, both good, just as health and the doctor are not in the same way the cause of a man's being healthy. That pleasure is produced in respect to each sense is plain, for we speak of sights and sounds as pleasant. It is also plain that it arises most of all when both the sense is at its best and it is active in reference to an object which corresponds. When both object and perceiver are of the best there will always be pleasure, since the requisite agent and patient are both present. Pleasure completes the activity not as the corresponding permanent state does by its imminence, but as an end which supervenes, as the bloom of youth does on those in the flower of their age. So long, then, as both the intelligible or sensible object and the discriminating or contemplative faculty are as they should be, the pleasure will be involved in the activity. For when both the passive and the active factor are unchanged and are related to each other in the same way, the same result naturally follows. How, then, is it that no one is continuously pleased? Is it that we grow weary? Certainly all human beings are incapable of continuous activity. Therefore pleasure also is not continuous, for it accompanies activity. Something delights us when they are new, but later does so less for the same reason. For at first the mind is in a state of stimulation, and intensely active about them, as people are with respect to their vision when they look hard at a thing. But afterwards our activity is not of this kind, but has grown relaxed, for which reason the pleasure also is dulled. One might think that all men desire pleasure, because they all aim at life. Life is an activity, and each man is active about those things and with those faculties that he loves most. For example, the musician is active with his hearing in reference to tunes, the student with his mind in reference to theoretical questions, and so on in each case. Now pleasure completes the activities, and therefore life, which they desire. It is with good reason, then, that they aim at pleasure too since for every one it completes life, which is desirable. But whether we choose life for the sake of pleasure or pleasure for the sake of life is a question we may dismiss for the present, for they seem to be bound up together and not to admit of separation, 
since without activity, pleasure does not arise, and every activity is completed by the attendant pleasure. Section 5. For this reason, pleasures seem, too, to differ in kind. For things different in kind are, we think, completed by different things. We see this to be true both of natural objects and of things produced by art. For example, animals, trees, a painting, a sculpture, a house, an implement. And similarly, we think that activities differing in kind are completed by things differing in kind. Now the activities of thought differ from those of the senses, and both differ among themselves in kind. So therefore do the pleasures that complete them. This may be seen, too, from the fact that each of the pleasures is bound up with the activity it completes. For an activity is intensified by its proper pleasure. Since each class of things is better judged of and brought to precision by those who engage in the activity with pleasure. For example, it is those who enjoy geometrical thinking that become geometers and grasp the propositions better. And similarly, those who are fond of music or of building, and so on, make the progress in their proper function by enjoying it. So the pleasures intensify the activities, and what intensifies a thing is proper to it. But things different in kind have properties different in kind. This will be even more apparent from the fact that activities are hindered by pleasures arising from other sources. For people who are fond of playing the flute are incapable of attending to arguments if they overhear someone playing the flute since they enjoy flute playing more than the activity at hand. So the pleasure connected with the flute playing destroys the activity concerned with argument. This happens similarly in all other cases, when one is active about two things at once. The more pleasant activity drives out the other, and if it is much more pleasant, does so all the more, so that one even seizes from the other. This is why when we enjoy anything very much, we do not throw ourselves into anything else, and do one thing only when we are not much pleased by another. For example, in the theater, the people who eat sweets do so most when the actors are poor. Now, since activities are made precise and more enduring and better by their proper pleasure, and injured by alien pleasures, evidently the two kinds of pleasure are far apart. For alien pleasures do pretty much what proper pains do, since activities are destroyed by their proper pains. For example, if a man finds writing or doing sums unpleasant and painful, he does not write or does not do sums because the activity is painful. So when activity suffers contrary effects from its proper pleasures and pains, in other words, from those that supervene on it in virtue of its own nature, and alien pleasures have been stated to do much the same as pain. They destroy the activity, only not to the same degree. Now, since activities differ in respect of goodness and badness, and some are worthy to be chosen, others to be avoided, and others neutral, so too are the pleasures. For to each activity there is a proper pleasure. The pleasure proper to a worthy activity is good, and that proper to an unworthy activity bad. Just as the appetites for noble objects are laudable, those for base objects culpable. But the pleasures involved in activities are more proper to them than the desires. For the latter are separated both in time and in nature, while the former are close to the activities and so hard to distinguish from them that it admits of dispute whether the activity is not the same as the pleasure. Still, pleasure does not seem to be thought or perception. That would be strange. But because they are not found apart, they appear to some people the same. As activities are different, then, so are the corresponding pleasures. Now sight is superior to touch in purity, and hearing in smell to taste. The pleasures, therefore, are similarly superior, and those of thought superior to these, and within each of the two kinds some are superior to others. Each animal is thought to have a proper pleasure, as it has a proper function, 
vis-a-vis -vis that which corresponds to X activity. If we survey them species by species, too, this will be evident. Horse, dog, and man have different pleasures. As Heraclitus says, asses would prefer sweepings to gold, for food is pleasanter than gold to asses. So the pleasures of creatures different in kind differ in kind. And it is plausible to suppose that those of a single species do not differ. But they vary to no small extent, in the case of men at least. The same things delight some people and pain others, and are painful and odious to some, and pleasant and to and liked by others. This happens too in the case of sweet things. The same things do not seem sweet to a man in a fever and a healthy man nor hot to a weak man and one in good condition. The same happens in other cases. But in all such matters, that which appears to the good man is thought to be really so. If this is correct, as it seems to be, and virtue and the good man as such are the measure of each thing, those also will be pleasures which appear so to him, and those things pleasant which he enjoys. If the things he finds tiresome seem pleasant to some one, that is nothing surprising. For men may be ruined and spoilt in many ways. But the things are not pleasant, but only pleasant to these people and to people in this condition. Those which are admittedly disgraceful plainly should not be said to be pleasures, except to a perverted taste. But of those that are thought to be good, what kind of pleasure or what pleasure should be said to be that proper to man? It is not plain from the corresponding activities. The pleasures follow these. Whether then the perfect and supremely happy man has one or more activities, the pleasures that perfect these will be said in the strict sense to be pleasures proper to man, and the rest will be so in a secondary infractional way, as are the activities. Section 6. Now that we have spoken of the virtues, the forms of friendship, and the varieties of pleasure, what remains is to discuss in outline the nature of happiness, since this is what we state the end of human nature to be. Our discussion will be the more concise if we first sum up what we have said already. We said, then, that it is not a disposition, for if it were, it might belong to someone who was asleep throughout his life, living the life of a plant, or again to someone who was suffering the greatest misfortunes. If these implications are unacceptable, and we must rather class happiness as an activity, as we have said before, and if some activities are necessary and desirable for the sake of something else, while others are so in themselves, Evidently, happiness must be placed among those desirable in themselves, not among those desirable for the sake of something else, for happiness does not lack anything, but is self-sufficient. Now those activities are desirable in themselves from which nothing is sought beyond the activity, and of this nature virtuous actions are thought to be. For to do noble and good deeds is a thing desirable for its own sake. Pleasant amusements also are thought to be of this nature. We choose them not for the sake of other things, for we are injured rather than benefited by them, since we are led to neglect our bodies and our property. But most of the people who are deemed happy take refuge in such pastimes, which is the reason why those who are ready-witted at them and are highly esteemed at the court of tyrants. They make themselves pleasant companions in the tyrant's favorite pursuits, and that is the sort of man they want. Now these things are thought to be of the nature of happiness, because people in despotic positions spend their leisure in them. But perhaps such people prove nothing, for virtue and reason from which good activities flow do not depend on despotic position nor in these people who have never tasted pure and generous pleasure, take refuge in the bodily pleasures. Should these, for that reason, be thought to be more desirable? For boys, too, think the things that are valued among themselves are the best. It is to be expected, then, that as different things seem valuable to boys and to men, so they should to bad men and to good. 
Now, as we have often maintained, those things are both valuable and pleasant, which are such to the good man. And to each man, the activity in accordance with his own disposition is most desirable. And therefore, to the good man, that which is in accordance with virtue. Happiness, therefore, does not lie in amusement. It would indeed be strange if the end were amusement, and one were to take trouble and suffer hardship all one's life in order to amuse oneself. For in a word, everything that we choose, we choose for the sake of something else, except happiness, which is an end. Now to exert oneself and work for the sake of amusement seems silly and utterly childish. But to amuse oneself in order that one may exert oneself, as Anacharsis puts it, seems right. For amusement is a sort of relaxation. And we need relaxation because we cannot work continuously. Relaxation, then, is not an end, for it is taken for the sake of activity. The happy life is thought to be virtuous. Now, a virtuous life requires exertion and does not consist in amusement. And we say that serious things are better than laughable things, and those connected with amusement, and that the activity of the better of any two things, whether it be two elements of our being or two men, is the more serious. But the activity of the better is ipso facto superior, and more of the nature of happiness. And any chance person, even a slave, can enjoy the bodily pleasures no less than the best man. But no one assigns to a slave a share in happiness, unless he assigns to him also a share in human life. For happiness does not lie in such occupations, but as we have said before, in virtuous activities. Section 7. If happiness is activity in accordance with virtue, it is reasonable that it should be in accordance with the highest virtue, and this will be that of the best thing in us. Whether it be reason or something else, that is this element which is thought to be our natural ruler and guide and to take thought of things noble and divine, whether it be itself also divine or only the most divine element in us. The activity of this in accordance with its proper virtue will be perfect happiness. That this activity is contemplative, we have already said. Now this would seem to be in agreement both with what we have said before and with the truth. For firstly, this activity is the best, since not only is reason the best thing in us, but the objects of reason are the best of noble objects. And secondly, it is the most continuous, since we can contemplate truth more continuously than we can do anything. And we think happiness has pleasure mingled with it, but the activity of philosophic wisdom is admittedly the pleasantest of virtuous activities. At all events, the pursuit of it is thought to offer pleasures marvelous for their purity and their enduringness. And it is to be expected that those who know will pass their time more pleasantly than those who inquire. And the self-sufficiency that is spoken of must belong most to the contemplative activity. For while a philosopher, as well as a just man or one possessing any other virtue, needs the necessaries of life, when they are sufficiently equipped with things of that sort, the just man needs people towards whom and with whom he shall act justly. And the temperate man, the brave man, and each of the others is in the same case. But the philosopher, even when by himself, can contemplate truth, and the better the wiser he is. He can perhaps do so better if he has fellow workers, but still he is the most self-sufficient. And this activity alone would seem to be loved for its own sake, for nothing arises from it apart from the contemplating, while from practical activities we gain more or less apart from the action. And happiness is thought to depend on leisure, for we are busy that we may have leisure, and make war that we may live in peace. Now the activity of the practical virtues is exhibited, 
in political or military affairs. But the actions concerned with these seem to be unleisurely. Warlike actions are completely so, for no one chooses to be at war, or provokes war, for the sake of being at war. Anyone would seem absolutely murderous if he were to make enemies of his friends in order to bring about battle and slaughter. But the action of the statesman is also unleisurely, and apart from the political action itself, aims at despotic power and honors, or at all events happiness, for him and his fellow citizens. A happiness different from political action, and evidently sought as being different. So if among virtuous actions, political and military actions are distinguished by nobility and greatness, and if these are unleisurely and aim at an end and are not desirable for their own sake, but in the activity of reason, which is contemplative, seems both to be superior in serious worth and to aim at no end beyond itself, and to have its pleasure proper to itself and this augments the activity. And the self-sufficiency, leisureliness, unweariedness, so far as this is possible for man, and all the other attributes ascribed to the supremely happy man are evidently those connected with this activity. It follows that this will be the complete happiness of man if it be allowed a complete term of life, for none of the attributes of happiness is incomplete. But such a life would be too high for man, for it is not in so far as he is man that he will live so, but in so far as something divine is present in him, and by so much as this is superior to our composite nature, is its activity superior to that which is the exercise of the other kind of virtue. If reason is divine, then, in comparison with man, the life according to it, is divine in comparison with human life. But we must not follow those who advise us, being men, to think of human beings, and being mortal of mortal things, but must, so far as we can, make ourselves immortal, and strain every nerve to live in accordance with the best thing in us. For even if it be small in bulk, much more does it in power and worth surpass everything. This would seem, too, to be each man himself, since it is the authoritative and better part of him. It would be strange, then, if he were to choose not the life of his self, but that of someone else. And what we said before will apply now. That which is proper to each thing is by nature best and most pleasant for each thing. For man, therefore, the life according to reason is best and pleasantest, since reason more than anything else is man. This life, therefore, is also the happiness. Section 8. But in a secondary degree, the life in accordance with the other kind of virtue is happy, for the activities in accordance with this befit our human estate. Just and brave acts and other virtuous acts we do in relation to each other, observing our respective duties with regard to contracts and services and all manner of actions, and with regard to passions. And all of these seem to be typically human. Some of them seem to arise from the body, and virtue of character to be in many ways bound up with the passions. Practical wisdom, too, is linked to virtue of character, and this to practical wisdom, since the principles of practical wisdom are in accordance with practical wisdom. Being connected with the passions also, the moral virtues must belong to our composite nature, and the virtues of our composite nature are human. So therefore are the life and the happiness which correspond to these. The excellence of the reason is a thing apart. We must be content to say this much about it, for to describe it precisely is a task greater than our purpose requires. It would seem, however, also to need external equipment, but little, or less than moral virtue does. Grant that both need the necessaries, and do so equally, even if the statesman's work is the more concerned with the body and things of that sort 
for there will be little difference there. But in what they need for the exercise of their activities, there will be much difference. The liberal man will need money for the doing of his liberal deeds, and the just man, too, will need it for the returning of services. For wishes are hard to discern, and even people who are not just pretend to wish to act justly. And the brave man will need power if he is to accomplish any of the acts that correspond to his virtue. And the temperate man will need opportunity, for how else is either he or any of the others to be recognized? It is debated, too, whether the will or the deed is more essential to virtue, which is assumed to involve both. It is surely clear that its perfection involves both, but for deeds many things are needed, and more the greater and nobler the deeds are. But the man who is contemplating the truth needs no such thing, at least with a view to the exercise of his activity. Indeed, they are, one may say, even hindrances, at all events to his contemplation. But insofar as he is a man and lives with a number of people, he chooses to do virtuous acts. He will therefore need such aids to living a human life. But that perfect happiness is a contemplative activity will appear from the following consideration as well. We assume the gods to be above all other beings blessed and happy. But what sort of actions must we assign to them? Acts of justice? Will not the gods seem absurd if they make contracts and return deposits and so on? Acts of a brave man, then, confronting dangers and running risks because it is noble to do so? Or liberal acts, to whom will they give? It will be strange if they are really to have money or anything of the kind. And what would their temperate acts be? Is not such praise tasteless, since they have no bad appetites? If we were to run through them all, the circumstances of action would be found trivial and unworthy of gods. Still, everyone supposes that they live and therefore that they are active. We cannot suppose them to sleep like Endymion. Now, if you take away from a living being action, and still more production, what is left but contemplation? Therefore, the activity of God, which surpasses all others in blessedness, must be contemplative. And of human activities, therefore, that which is most akin to this must be most the nature of happiness. This is indicated, too, by the fact that the other animals have no share in happiness, being completely deprived of such activity. For while the whole life of the gods is blessed, and that of men, too, insofar as some likeness of such activity belongs to them, none of the other animals is happy, since they in no way share in contemplation. Happiness extends, then, just so far as contemplation does, and those to whom a contemplation more fully belongs are more truly happy, not as a mere concomitant, but in virtue of the contemplation, for this is in itself precious. Happiness, therefore, must be some form of contemplation. But being a man, one will also need external prosperity, for our nature is not self-sufficient for the purpose of contemplation. But our body also must be healthy and must have food and other attention. Still, we must not think that the man who is to be happy will need many things or great things, merely because he cannot be supremely happy without external goods. For self-sufficiency in action do not involve excess, and when we can do noble acts without ruling earth and sea, for even with moderate advantages one can act virtuously. This is manifest enough, for private persons are thought to do worthy acts, no less than despots, indeed even more. And it is enough that we should have so much as that. For the life of the man who is active in accordance with virtue will be happy. Solon, too, was perhaps sketching well the happy man when he described him as moderately furnished with externals, but as having done, as Solon thought, the noblest acts, and lived temperately, 
for one can with but moderate possessions do what one ought. Anaxagoras also seems to have supposed the happy man not to be rich nor a despot, when he said that he would not be surprised if the happy man were to seem to most people a strange person. For they judge by externals, since these are all they perceive. The opinions of the wise seem then to harmonize with our arguments. But while even such things carry some conviction, the truth in practical matters is discerned from the facts of life. For these are the decisive factor. We must therefore survey what we have already said, bringing it to test of the facts of life. And if it harmonizes with the facts, we must accept it. But if it clashes with them, we must suppose it to be mere theory. Now he who exercises his reason and cultivates it seems to be both in the best state of mind and most dear to the gods. For if the gods have any care for human affairs, as they are thought to have, it would be reasonable both that they should delight in that which was best and most akin to them, in other words, reason, and that they should reward those who love and honor this most, as caring for the things that are dear to them, and acting both rightly and nobly. And that all these attributes belong most of all to the philosopher is manifest. He, therefore, is the dearest to the gods. And he who is that will presumably be also the happiest, so that in this way, too, the philosopher will more than any other be happy. Section 9. If these matters and the virtues, and also friendship and pleasure, have been dealt with sufficiently in outline, are we to suppose that our program has reached its end? Surely, as the saying goes, where there are things to be done, the end is not to survey and recognize the various things, but rather to do them. With regard to virtue, then, it is not enough to know, but we must try to have and use it, or try any other way there may be of becoming good. Now, if arguments were in themselves enough to make men good, they would justly, as Theognis says, have won very great rewards, and such rewards should have been provided. But as things are, while they seem to have power to encourage and stimulate the generous-minded among our youth, and to make a character which is gently born, and a true lover of what is noble, ready to be possessed by virtue, they are not able to encourage the many to nobility and goodness. For these do not by nature obey the sense of shame, but only fear, and do not abstain from bad acts because of their baseness, but through fear of punishment. Living by passion, they pursue their own pleasures and the means to them, and the opposite pains, and have not even a conception of what is noble and truly pleasant, since they have never tasted it. What argument would remold such people? It is hard, if not impossible, to remove by argument the traits that have long since been incorporated in the character. And perhaps we must be content if, when all the influences by which we are thought to become good are present, we get some tincture of virtue. Now some think that we are made good by nature, others by habituation, others by teaching. Nature's part evidently does not depend on us, but as a result of some divine causes, is present in those who are truly fortunate. While argument and teaching, we may suspect, are not powerful with all men, but the soul of the student must first have been cultivated by means of habits for noble joy and noble hatred, like earth which is to nourish the seed. For he who lives as passion directs will not hear argument that dissuades him, nor understand it if he does. And how can we persuade one in such a state to change his ways? And in general, passion seems to yield not to argument, but to force. The character, then, must somehow be there already with a kinship to virtue, loving what is noble and hating what is base. But it is difficult to get from youth up a right training for virtue if one has not been brought up under right laws. For to live temperately and heartily is not pleasant to most people, 
especially when they are young. For this reason, their nurture and occupations should be fixed by law, for they will not be painful when they have become customary. But it is surely not enough that when they are young they should get the right nurture and attention, since they must, even when they are grown up, practice and be habituated to them. We shall need laws for this as well, and generally speaking to cover the whole of life. For most people obey necessity rather than argument, and punishments rather than the sense of what is noble. This is why some think that legislators ought to stimulate men to virtue and urge them forward by the motive of the noble, on the assumption that those who have been well advanced by the formation of habits will attend to such influences, and that punishments and penalties should be imposed on those who disobey and are of inferior nature, while the incurably bad should be completely banished. A good man, they think, since he lives with his mind fixed on what is noble, will submit to argument, while a bad man whose desire is for pleasure is corrected by pain like a beast of burden. This is, too, why they say the pains inflicted should be those that are most opposed to the pleasures such men love. However that may be, if, as we have said, the man who is to be good must be well trained and habituated, and go on to spend his time in worthy occupations, and neither willingly nor unwillingly do bad actions. And if this can be brought about, if men live in accordance with a sort of reason and right order, provided this has force. If this be so, the paternal command indeed has not the required force or compulsive power, nor in general has the command of one man, unless he be a king or something similar. But the law has compulsive power, while it is at the same time a rule proceeding from a sort of practical wisdom and reason. And while people hate men who oppose their impulses, even if they oppose them rightly, the law in its ordaining of what is good is not burdensome. In the Spartan state alone, or almost alone, the legislator seems to have paid attention to questions of nurture and occupations. In most states, such matters have been neglected, and each man lives as he pleases. Cyclops fashion to his own wife and children dealing law. Now it is best that there should be a public and proper care for such matters, but if they are neglected by the community, it would seem right for each man to help his children and friends towards virtue, and that they should have the power or at least the will to do this. It would seem from what has been said that he can do this better if he makes himself capable of legislating. For public control is plainly affected by laws, and good control by good laws, whether written or unwritten would seem to make no difference, nor whether they are laws providing for the good education of individuals or of groups, any more than it does in the case of music or gymnastics and other such pursuits. For as in cities, laws and prevailing types of character have force, so in households do the injunctions and the habits of the father, and these have even more because of the tie of blood and the benefits he confers. For the children start with a natural affection and disposition to obey. Further, private education has an advantage over public, as private medical treatment has. For while, in general, rest and abstinence from food are good for a man in fever, for a particular man they may not be, and a boxer presumably does not prescribe the same style of fighting to all his pupils. It would seem, then, that the detail is worked out with more precision if the control is private, for each person is more likely to get what suits his case. But the details can be best looked after one by one by a doctor or gymnastic instructor or anyone else who has the general knowledge of what is good for everyone or for people of a certain kind. For the sciences both are said to be and are concerned with what is universal. Not but what some particular detail may perhaps be well looked after by an unscientific person if he has studied accurately in the light of experience what happens in each case, 
just as some people seem to be their own best doctors, though they could give no help to anyone else. Nonetheless, it will perhaps be agreed that if a man does wish to become a master of an art or science, he must go to the universal, and come to know it as well as possible. For, as we have said, it is with this that the sciences are concerned. And surely he who wants to make men, whether many or few, better by his care, must try to become capable of legislating if it is through laws that we can become good. For to get anyone whatever, anyone who is put before us, into the right condition is not for the first chance comer. If anyone can do it, it is the man who knows, just as in medicine and all other matters which give scope for caring prudence. Must we not, then, next examine whence or how one can learn how to legislate? Is it, as in all other cases, from statesmen? Certainly it was thought to be a part of statesmanship. Or is a difference apparent between statesmanship and the other sciences and arts? In the others, the same people are found offering to teach the arts and practicing them, for example, doctors or painters. But while the sophists profess to teach politics, it is not practiced by any of them, but by the politicians who would seem to be so by dint of a certain skill and experience rather than of thought. For they are not found either writing or speaking about such matters, though it were a nobler occupation perhaps than composing speeches for the law courts and the assembly. Nor again are they found to have made statesmen of their own sons or any other of their friends. But it was to be expected that they should, if they could, for there is nothing better than such a skill that they could have left to their cities, or could prefer to have for themselves, or therefore for those dearest to them. Still, experience seems to contribute not a little. Else they could not have become politicians by familiarity with politics. And so it seems that those who aim at knowing about the art of politics need experience as well. But those of the sophists who profess the art seem to be very far from teaching it. For, to put the matter generally, they do not even know what kind of thing it is, nor what kinds of things it is about. Otherwise they would not have classed it as identical with rhetoric, or even inferior to it, nor have thought it easy to legislate by collecting the laws that are thought well of. They say it is possible to select the best laws, as though even the selection did not demand intelligence, and as though right judgment were not the greatest thing, as in matters of music. For while people experienced in any department judge rightly the works produced in it, and understand by what means or how they are achieved, and what harmonizes with what, the inexperienced must be content if they do not fail to see whether the work has been well or ill made as in the case of painting. Now laws are, as it were, the works of the political art. How, then, can one learn from them to be a legislator, or judge which are best? Even medical men do not seem to be made by a study of textbooks. Yet people try, at any rate, to state not only the treatments, but also how particular classes of people can be cured and should be treated, distinguishing the various habits of body, but while this seems useful to experienced people, to the inexperienced it is valueless. Surely then, while collections of laws, and of constitutions also, may be serviceable to those who can study them and judge what is good or bad, and what enactments suit what circumstances, those who grow through such collections without a practiced faculty will not have right judgment, unless it be as a spontaneous gift of nature though they may perhaps become more intelligent in such matters. Now our predecessors have left the subject of legislation to us unexamined. It is perhaps best, therefore, that we should ourselves study it, and in general study the ability of the Constitution, in order to complete, to the best of our ability, our philosophy of human nature. First, then, if anything has been said well in detail by earlier thinkers, let us try to review it. 
then in the light of the constitutions we have collected, let us study what sorts of influence preserve and destroy states, and what sorts preserve or destroy the particular kinds of constitution, and to what causes it is due that some are well and others ill administered. When these have been studied, we shall perhaps be more likely to see with a comprehensive view which constitution is best, and how each must be ordered, and what laws and customs it must use, if it is to be at its best. Let us make a beginning of our discussion.